Um, Jewish tradition teaches that there's the written Torah and the oral Torah. There's the Torah that is in the scroll, the five books of Moses, but there's also all the rabbinic commentary that comes later, all the conversations that come later. And after that, there's more commentary and more commentary. I mean, my bookshelves are full of taking every word, every phrase, every punctuation mark and dissecting it and exploring it. And so I guess what, what challenges me in this conversation is to say, why do we interpret every little bit, but we take one verse or two verses from the Torah and use these as an absolutism, not only to say we don't um, allow for gay marriage or we don't allow for um, talking about gay rights, but that we don't allow gay people to exist, because that's not at all what Judaism is about. There are many teachings in Judaism about how we treat people. And rather than jumping to Leviticus, start at the very beginning of the story of creation. Um, start with how God created humanity and start with the story about creation and the first problem in the world. And the Torah says that the first problem in the world is that it's not good for humankind to be alone. Everything that gets created is good. God created light and darkness and it was good. God created the first day and it was good, the second day and it was good. But it's not good for people to be alone. And the message there is the same for straight people as it is for gay people. People shouldn't be alone. I think the faith argument is a challenging one because there are many different ways that people experience faith. I think it's important to remember we have a separation of church and state, synagogue and state, mosque and state in our country. And so it's always really a difficult balance for me to have this conversation. I think when I speak to people of faith, obviously when I speak to people in my own community, uh, but even to people generally in the faith community, I think we can have a conversation as people of faith agreeing that that's what we're talking about. But I find it really problematic that my religious values are going to dictate what happens in the state. I keep kosher. I don't eat pork. I don't eat shellfish. I don't mix milk and meat. I don't expect that we should outlaw the selling of pork in the state because I don't eat pork. I do expect that I get to legislate what I eat or I get to work with my community to legislate what we do, but I would never think that I would have the right to inform what someone else can do. I think the opposition speaks often from ignorance. If you don't ever experience a loving couple who shares a home, who shares a life, who may or may not share children, you can't conceptualize what a gay marriage would look like. You only have bits and pieces of a story. You have a piece of text that talks about a man lying with a man, perhaps about a sexual act, perhaps about um, a piece of a larger story about um, non-consensual sex, and you use that, you apply that to a situation that you really know nothing about. And I think that's a big piece of why people are speaking out, is they really don't have a context, they don't have a story. And because they're pushing people away from their own communities, they're not hearing those messages. I'm worried about people who come to their place of worship every week and expect to be welcomed to hear messages of hate from their pulpit. Um, there are a lot of people who still put themselves in communities that don't outwardly include them because they find other spiritual life there. Um, I'm lucky that my congregation comes to services on Friday night or Saturday and it gets to experience their whole self be welcomed. But I'm really aware that some people have made choices to be in other communities um, and be in the closet or just not really be out. And I'm really scared for those people who go to church or synagogue or to their mosque and hear a message of hate and feel like that's pointed at them. Um, because I hear these stories in other states when these conversations were happening that when conversations around marriage were happening, um, we saw an increase in bullying in schools, we saw an increase in hate, hate crimes, and I'm really worried about that and that impact on our state. My area of focus is as the Director of Lifelong Learning to work on education, and so how are we really showing our young people and our adult learners that to be part of a Jewish community is to be part of an inclusive, welcoming, diverse community, and that diversity is our strength, not our, our challenge. I start to think, what is a place of marriage in secular society at all. If we're talking about who gets to visit us in the hospital, if we talk about who should get to have access to health insurance, I wonder if the whole system is fundamentally flawed and that we really need to radically rethink how we allow people to define who's important to them. I spend a lot of time with people whose biological families are not the people they would want around them if, God forbid, they were sick. I spend a lot of time with people who um, really see their family as other people who are not their significant other or their children or their, their parents. And I think that part of what our conversation needs to be about is what is family and who are the important people to us and how are we honoring that and giving people access to certain opportunities. I mean, health insurance is a big part of that. Um, to be able to have access to health insurance is a, is a matter of life and death. And so are we doing that based on this idea of 
romantic love and the idea of marriage, or are we saying everyone should have access to health insurance, and that's really the issue we're trying to work on? And how do we have those conversations and decouple them from, from the marriage conversation?